Hello, everybody. Welcome to class. Oh, hold on. There we go. The light was off. Welcome to CS302 Online, video four. Hope you guys had a good, long Labor Day weekend. So we only have class once this week, so it's kind of cool, and you get to get another nice little break. So uh, let's go ahead and get started, though. So today we are going to be talking about recurrence relations. Uh, hi, a quick question. So we already have the questions already. Uh, for, so for big O certificates, it's supposed to be f of n is less than or equal to c times g of n. So for big omega, would it be the same thing but the sign flipped? Uh, yes. And you do indeed flip, flip it from less than or equal to to greater than or equal to because you always have to include in both cases when it's equal to. So you are correct in that. So yes, you do, you do indeed flip it um, depending on if you're doing omega or theta. And in the, in the, or sorry, omega or big L. And in the case of theta, by the way, you have to put in both, and that's why theta has a constant, k1 and k2, that sort of bind it together and sort of squeeze, squish it in between, and, and that's how you get your theta. So, yep, you're good. Cool. Uh, all right, then. So, today we are going to continue looking at this whole asymptotic complexity, but in a different way. Uh, in fact, if we um, if we kind of think about how we, how we were doing... Uh, uh, asymptotic complexity right now we're kind of limiting ourselves to loops right and how so like if we have a loop that says like for n i is equal to zero i is less than n and then uh, i plus plus basically that's going to run n times right and uh, you know that's 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 okay that's useful but not all code can be written like that so here let me just write kind of an example of that oh no please don't tell me I have that bug I think I have the bug where I can't write. Um, it just like selects things. Oh, that's, cool. that's great. Let me take my watch off because sometimes that glitches it. Uh, that's a very, very annoying bug. Ah, you know, interesting. How, I remember how I fixed it last time? I did something. I think I... Okay, I see. Yeah. There we go. So, so, so yeah, that fi that fixes it for some reason. Also, now we get the laser pointer working too, which is nice. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So it's an interesting feature slash bug. But okay, so let me go ahead and put that loop in there. So if you know, we could have a, we could have code in this format, but it's never going to be always this case, right? That we have something like this that is kind of easy or obvious to to figure out what the asymptotic complexity is. Of course, it's not always going to be the variable n, but when you when you have a when you have a program and you got a bunch of variables and you're trying to figure out which of them matters because I mean here it's like okay I have a variable called n and in the assignments I think I give you variables called n so most of the times for that for that second assignment that you got but the reality of things is that that uh, not you know if you go and look at like a piece of code out there in the real world it's not going to be conveniently labeled as n so you got to figure out which of the variables do you measure and so when you're doing that um, there's no clear cut answer. But my advice is to look at it in relation to what you're trying to solve the complexity of. So like if it's a sorting problem, then typically what you want to find out at the end is the size of the list that you're sorting. Uh, if, if it's an algorithm that is dealing with, with some data, typically the size of the data or the number of operations on that data is going to represent that n, the number of computations. So typically, you know, again, synthetic complexity can be in terms of space or time. And with space, is usually going to deal with the with the, with the size of the data that you're working with, like a list. And in terms of time, it's typically going to deal with the operations of that data. So that could be the comparisons or swapping for sorting, or uh, uh, for example, with graphs, uh, potentially traversing from one spot to the next, things like that. So yeah, yeah, comparing to seeing which way you go and and so on. So. So as we go through the different algorithms, you, you'll kind of learn about that. But for now, we're just kind of sticking to this basic loop and code, right? So uh, it's not the end of the story. But anyways, so, you know, this is nice. But like, let's say that we, uh, that we made it a little bit more complicated by making this n times n here, okay? So now the asymptotic complexity of this is O1 squared. And by the way, I had a question over the weekend on Discord asking, well, what is the omega of this? 
And it turns out that if, if your code is of this format, and then there's you know some code in here, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's not modifying I, you know, and changing the way the loop works, then this code's gonna have the same omega, the same theta, and the same big O. Because there's no modification, the code always runs the exact same amount of times, regardless of the of what is the input. Now, that's important to understand, right? Because what I'm saying here, you know, suppose that this was a, a function that all it does is it, it just prints out some some array uh, r sub i okay let's just say that's what it does okay and, and i is declared up here somewhere in this case here you know this will take the same amount of time regardless of the content of the array r okay so if the array contains a bunch of ones or a bunch of fives or just random numbers it doesn't matter how long uh, what's in the array because it'll always take the same amount of time and because of that, the best, the best case scenario or the worst case scenario or kind of like the theta, the average case kind of thing, they're all the same. And that's, that's okay. Here's where you could see something that would be different. Let's say there was an if statement that said like, if, uh, if I is equal, equal to zero, that's all you're going to do. Otherwise, there's another loop in there. You know, for int i is equal to zero. Well, I guess we'll use a different variable. J is equal to zero. J is less than n. J plus plus. And then there, there'd be like a C out. R i plus one. Let's say that's the array of integers, okay? In this case, it's different. If we didn't have the if else, if we just had like two, the two nested loops, then the, I hope that you can see that the time complexity of this would be O n cubed. I made a pause there, hopefully, so you guys thought about it for a second since before just giving the answer. But yeah, that would be what the, what the complexity would be. However, here we have a little if statement. You know, in, in one specific scenario where i is equal to zero, you know, um, well, actually, uh, this is kind of not, not what I was trying to, uh, what I intended to do here. Um, actually, well, okay. If, if we had the code that we have now, uh, I would say that in all, in all, you know, this this is really just still n cubed. Uh, the reality of this is that it, the the exact number of this would be that it would be n squared uh, times n, and then there's one scenario where it's, where there's no n for when, whenever uh, i is equal to zero. So I guess you would remove and be like one plus that minus that okay but that's not what i'm trying to get to here what i wanted to do is actually not i is equal to zero but actually the contents of the array so if ari is equal to zero that's what i wanted to do okay because now this piece of code is going to is going to do different things depending on what is contained in the array and if we don't know ahead of time what's in the array that's when we're going to start playing with big O and, and, uh, and big Omega and theta, potentially. Here's the thing. Now, if the contents of your array are a bunch of zeros, like let's say the array is just completely full of zeros, and you're always going to be running this piece of code because of that. You're never going to run the loop. In this case, Omega would be N squared because you're always running the outer loop. You are always indeed running this loop. This loop is always running, okay? In fact, maybe pick a different color for that. You're always running this loop up here, right? So that's n squared. However, the inner loop here is only running if the contents of the, of the array is not a zero. So if the array was full of zeros, only the outer loop would run, right? So that would be O1 squared. If the inner loop runs, then then well, technically omega would be omega n squared, because because that would be the ideal case. Like, hey, we're really crossing our fingers that there's a bunch of zeros in that array, so that we get that. And then the big O would be n cubed. Okay, so now you would you actually see a difference between them. And theta would you have to throw in a constant between them? Um, it would probably be a it would, it would be probably around n, n cubed theta because pretty much every single case except that special case is n squared. So theta would be pretty much n cubed, but you would have to list some constants to do that, which would be some really big constants to uh, to get that going. So this is just an example to show you how 
the contents of what you're working with can change the the asymptotic complexity and now there can be a divergence between big O and big omega okay and that's because now there's this magical beautiful if statement right and that's what changes everything because now it actually matters what's in the array okay so uh, again as we look at more algorithms we will we'll, uh, let me scroll through that a little bit more we'll, we'll, we'll analyze this further okay but now we're gonna turn the page here and um, let's look at, yeah here I had one example that I wanted to run um, this one yeah let's let's uh, yeah yeah this one, this, one, this one so let's try this one next okay so I is equal to 1 I is less than n times n. So I found this one on the internet. And I was like, hey, that's a good one to run. And hopefully this is this helps you to do the second assignment if you if we're kind of stuck over the weekend for it. Because I think it's not due yet, right? It's probably due like this week. This it's probably due tomorrow or or this weekend, I think, right? Okay. So, is this Sunday? Yeah. Okay. Great. So that's maybe you get the you get the basically the whole weekend to do it. So this the, you know it's still useful this content. Okay. So here we got a little, a little bit of code. We got two two loops and some operation. Right. This operation is kind of irrelevant. You know we say it's all one, so it's whatever. It's a constant. Uh, what we really you know however that O of one is going to be run a couple of times. You know, this one, the easiest one to figure out, because we said it before, is just n squared. But this inner one, you know, what is that? You know, is that is that running n times? Is that running less? How often is that running? In the simplest form, you can look at it the first time it's running, how much is going to run. And it is going to run from zero uh, until basically one. So just one time, right? OK, what about the last time that it runs? Well, in the last time that it runs, i is going to contain basically n squared, right? So here, let me write that down before I change. So I'm looking at the first and the last run to kind of get a better idea of what's going to happen here. In the first run, you know, j is going to be equal to zero and i is going to be equal to one. So it's just going to run one time, right? So one time in the beginning, that's it. That's how much this inner loop is going to run, okay? So you could say that it's going to be just n squared times if this loop only ran one every single time. But that's not the case, right? Because we're going to look at the end scenario. In the end scenario, the last time the, in, the the inner loop is going to be run is when the outer loop has an i that is approximately, you know, approximately n squared because it's going to be n times n, right? In fact, it's going to be uh, potentially one, minus one that amount, right? Because otherwise it would have, it would have not gone into this loop right here. Right. That if let's say n was a, is n was 10. OK, if n was 10, that means that 10 times 10 is 100. So the last time it's going to run is when i is equal to 99. Right. Because when it gets to 100, then it would have not gone into this loop because 100 is not less than 100. Right. So we know that is basically the equivalent of 99. That means that this inner loop potentially would be running with i being equal to 99 which means that zero is going to go all the way to 99. So potentially at the end of the scenario, that inner loop is running n squared times, okay? So really, if you just wanted to have a, you know, you're taking the test and you just want to get a complexity that is valid for this, you could just say that this takes O of n to the fourth. And that would be a correct answer. Because remember, I could say that something takes O of n factorial and pretty much just say that every algorithm we're going to learn in this class fits in that category. Because through this, it does. Everything is definitely smaller than that but you know you're kind of covering yourself it's like saying the top speed of my car is 10 miles per hour that way if you sell your car to somebody they can't complain that you didn't you lied to them about the top speed because like they're at least going to get 10 miles per hour if they get more that's great you know you're just saying you can at least get 10 miles per hour okay so now the question is is this good enough of course not because like you're selling yourself short this 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 does not really take n squared times because it only it really takes n squared in that last loop. But anything before that is going to be less than that. So really, there's there's a there's a there's a more accurate sort of solution to that, and so a more elegant way of doing it too. And so that's kind of what I want what I want to talk about. The reality of things is that this inner loop is is is, is a sort of a summation that is running. Um, First one time, then two times, then three times, then four times, all the way until n squared. 
And it turns out that you can represent that sort of summation. And if you remember in math, you get the symbol is usually the sum of, you know, and you put here sort of like your starting point. And then at the top, you put your ending point, which is n squared. So uh, if you ever see this symbol in math, you know, the sum of something, what it really means in code, you know, if, if you see if you if you see a math problem and you're trying to convert it to code and you see this symbol, what it means is a loop from and this is your starting point and this is your ending point. OK, so literally, you know, if, if, if I throw in variables at this, you know, a for loop is made up of like three parts, right? Let's say A, B and C, right? A is like int equal to zero. B is like I is less than N and then C is the I plus plus, right? So this is you got the initialization, the loop comparison and then the increment part, right? If you look at that in the summation, what that kind of looks like is A is down here, which is your initializer. B here is kind of like saying I, I you know, I is less than this number here, you know? And then um, your C is just happening. It's just always gonna be plus plus, like it's always gonna be plus one, okay? So I just wanted to make sure that you all understand whenever you see the symbol in math, it's just a basic loop, okay? So what we're saying is that the inner loop is going to kind of follow this sort of summation from, from the outer loop, okay? And it turns out that this can be written as n squared, and then the inner one can be as n squared plus 1 divided by 2, okay? That would be the more accurate way of representing this. And then if we simplify that, then we just get basically n to the 4 plus n squared divided by 2, okay? However, this is, again, the same thing as saying... O of n to the fourth. Why is that the case? Because this is the biggest number in here. This is the biggest power per se. And while these are significant in some way or form, this one's which is just a constant. So you know, if you look back at the definition, you're, this is, could be like an m of one half, whatever. You can just throw that away. But more importantly, the n squared is not going to grow anywhere as fast as to the n to the fourth. So it kind of becomes insignificant. And so we don't really write it, and that's why we still just write O and fourth. So while you were correct in saying that uh, this was indeed n to the fourth, this would have been a more elegant way. And if anybody really asked what the exact number would have been, you could say that it's just that it's this. Okay? Can you give an example of certificate for this example? Uh, yes, I can. So in this case, the certificate for this, you know, we, we want to say that n4 plus n squared divided by 2 is less than or equal to m times um, o of n to the fourth, which you can just write it by saying, um, here, I'll just rewrite it here. So this, this part, you can just rewrite as saying n to the fourth, okay? So that's kind of what we want to do, all right? And so now this, this is tricky because it turns out that that um, you, you can't just come up with a number here that will uh, fix this because this power here is going to kind of overtake that number given enough time, right? Which causes some issues. Um, so, so you have two ways to approach this, okay? One way to approach it is to have more than one constant in your certificate. So one way you can approach it is you can say uh, n times three times two and then have a constant in front of each of them. So let me rewrite that down here. So you can say n to the fourth, n to the third, n to the second, and n. And then you can say c1, c2, c3, c4, c5, and then just put a bunch of pluses here. And so if you write it in this format, now you can go ahead and write a certificate for, um, in this case would be c, um, C1 and C3 for n is greater than 1. And this would all, this would both be basically 1 half, right? Should it be, what did you say? Should it be n cubed plus n squared? Uh, no, where would you get the cube from? It's, this is how, this is n squared plus times n squared plus 1 divided by 2. These two become a 4. The, the n2 plus 1 it times 1 is just n squared, and then the divided by 2. So I don't know where you would get the cube from. But, uh, yeah, I know for sure this is right. The solution is hidden back there. So, yes. No, I meant we added the initial terms. Uh, 
above. So you're saying right here should be n cube plus n square. Uh, no, so, so I have n to the fourth. I got n to the cubed, n to the squared, to the n, and then just as, I don't know what this little s here is. I don't know where that came from. Oh, that lets me see five. So that was correct there. And I guess times one if it makes it feel better. The inequality. Um, well, I wasn't saying that I'm going to be multiplying them like this. I'm just trying to say that what I'm expanding, the, the m times n part, I am expanding it into this format here. Okay? If that makes more sense. Um, yes. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the, the other way. But this is one way of doing it is to have a multiple constants and then representing them this way so people know which ones they are. And if you do that, let's go ahead and, and separate this into two uh, into two pieces. Uh, if, if my if my algebra serves me correctly, you can do this to this, right? You can split it like that, and then um, what you end up doing is this just becomes one half over here, and then this becomes one half as well. Oh, dang it! Come on, there we go. Okay. And so that is how I'm getting those constants. And then this could be a perfectly valid certificate for that, okay? Given this part above as well, so they know which is what. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is, let's go ahead and copy and paste this one more time. Is I can literally try to come up with a number that will work for this uh, as is. So I could say something like, um, I'm just going to arbitrarily pick 10, okay? I'm going to say that m is equal to 10. Is that going to always grow faster than this? And you'll see that in some cases it will, but the problem that, it's, that you have here is this this guy is gonna gonna give you gonna be a headache right because can we make that grow faster than uh than, than this constant alone right um so you know if we, if we were if we were to try some numbers here you would find that that this would work for some range of numbers of, of n but eventually um this this exponent will prove to be just a pain so i like frankly i would go with this method but uh if you do this then you will have to find a significantly large 10 that uh that will that will avoid this but you will still end up running to a situation where the where the other exponent will overtake it because this is this is something this is a constant at the end of the day and this you know yes here it's divided by half so we kind of have a, are lucky in that sense, but if this equation was just simply n, n, to, n to the fourth plus n squared, uh, no matter how big of a constant you pick, your is this is always going to be because it's an exponent. It's always going to eventually overtake it, so that causes issues. Okay, so I would encourage you to just do this and make your life easier. So um, there, that is your answer to a certificate, and it's good because I was going to go over this eventually. Uh, when you have exponents, uh, more than one, one more than one uh, piece of your equation has the n n to it to an exponent. Okay. So, um, any other questions on this before I move on? While the questions come up, let me tell you what's next. So, again, we are just analyzing code with loops. Right, we're just analyzing this kind of code. Now, what if we had some code that was potentially recursive code? So, suppose that we had something like this. Okay, we have questions now. Uh, and you would do the same for big omega certificate? Uh, yes, yeah, I would say yes. You, 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 yes, you would just flip the inequality sign. Yes, 
Uh, it's very rarely seen, but yes, you will do it. Yes. So what you would here? I can I can I can go I can actually throw in really, really fast. So um, in this scenario, you're coming up with um, let's say well for this one it's the same thing omega and theta, um, and and and. Uh, and they go but for the one with the first one that we did here where they're different then you can just basically go ahead and put your equation and say that this is in this case is going to be less than or equal to right because the other one is greater than or equal to the m times uh in this case n cube and then well this, this one there's no constants or anything m is just equal to one so this will be c equal to one and then is greater than one that would be your certificate but uh let's say that just 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 for the heck of it it was 2n squared like that then um it basically as long as your m is oh wait 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 i didn't flip the sign i didn't flip the sign there we go now i flipped the sign right now we're doing omega so um in this case you know you you just have to pick an m that is smaller than that so yeah that's a lot easier to do because you just you can just you should just leave it alone you don't you don't make any numbers there you put a one or something don't put zero for your constant that's not a good thing technically speaking i suppose that the rest of these c's are zeros by the way just if you wanted to get rid of the numbers right we just don't really put it but uh in this case like c2 is equal to zero right because we don't have this term in the solution so yeah but anyways going into this example with recursion we have a function that is going to recursively compute the exponent. In a very, very, very uh, rather inefficient way, but that's not the point. The point is that we have this and we have to figure out what the asymptotic complexity of this is. One, one way you could do it, I suppose, is you could try to convert it into iterative code using a sort of a conversion from, from loops to, to code with a stack or whatever, and then try to take the time complexity of that but that's a lot of work and uh, it might not be very practical for a lot of the scenarios where uh, where you have recursive code and so we need to find a way of, of measuring how long a code takes to run for something that involves recursion and so again that brings us into the topic of the day which is recurrence relations and recurrence relation is basically trying to compute the time required to solve a problem of size n okay and so uh, a recursive relation will help you do that for for uh, for determining the running time of a recursive program. Okay, and here's the thing: recurrence relations are also themselves recursive. Okay, so let me maybe maybe write this down. Recurrence relations are used to determine. the runtime of a recursive program. And they themselves are recursive as well, okay? I guess I'll put that. So as you can kind of realize, this is gonna be very fun because uh, we were serving recursion with more recursion. So yeah, it'd be interesting. So the way we kind of want to express that is we, you know, if you remember recursion, recursion has two major components in it, right? And those are the base case and the recursive case, right? So if we look up here at this code, the base case is if n is equal to zero, return one. And that's because, you know, the way we're computing this is we're, we're multiplying and then taking minus one until we, we, we finish going through all of them. And then we fit and then, and then uh, the last thing that we're going to see is when it's in a zero, in which case we don't want to multiply times zero because that's just going to make the entire solution be zero. You just return a one because it doesn't change what you're multiplying by. So you always want to have a base case and you always want to have your base case checked before the recursive case. What happens if you try to do the recursion before you check for the base case? What's going to happen then? What's going to happen is that you're just going to be recursing forever and you're going to have an infinite recursion, right? And so 
And this, of course, is not ideal because then you will segmentation fault or you will just be able to, you will, if you might be able to solve your problem if you're printing same things as you go, but you don't want this thing to just crash on its own afterwards, right? And so it's very important that you have a base case and that you always check it before a recursive case. Now, that is not to get confused because there are terms such as tail and head recursion. That has to do with the operation that you're doing because technically speaking, there is a third component to recursion. There's the base case, the recursive case, and then there's whatever you're actually doing with the recursion, right? So if there's a the multiplication that you're doing or computing something or going to or printing something, there's that operation, right? And that operation that you're doing can happen before the recursive case or after the recursive case. And that's what defines head and tail recursion. You'll learn more about that in 326 and the compilers and all those classes. But that has nothing to do with what the base case is. The base case should always be before the recursive case, whether it's head or tail recursion, okay? And the base case is not always as obvious as this, where it's like, if, if n is equal to something, return. You know, that's, that's nice because it's like obvious, but not always gonna be the case. Sometimes, the, you know, I could rewrite this by saying if n is not equal to zero, you know, if n is not equal to zero, then go ahead and return, uh, and then just rewrite this, this, this thing in there. Let me shrink that. And then I think I can get away with just doing that. And then, I mean, I technically have to return in the case of when it is equal to zero. So I can just say uh, return one like that. That's a little bit more misleading and harder to figure out what, what the base case truly is. But uh, then, then, then the one on the left hand side, right? But, you know, you can definitely run into scenarios like that. So I'm just going to shrink that away into non-existence. But Again, we're starting with the simple examples. So we're going to start with an example where something is very obvious where the base case and the recursive case is, okay? So that same concept of a base case and a recursive case gets translated into recurrence relations. Recurrence relations are going to have a base case, which in this case is represented as the time to solve the, the most basic, I suppose, of the problems. So basically the problem of size zero, because you can't have a problem that is smaller than that. You can't have a problem that's of negative size, right? If you're sorting a list, the smallest list that you could have is an empty list. Or a list of size one, you could also say in some scenarios, because in some scenarios, it might not make sense to have an empty list. But again, that would be the smallest cases, either an empty list or a list of just one item, right? So that is gonna be kind of a base case in recurrence relations. You could have multiple base cases in recurrence relations, by the way, just like you have, can have multiple base cases in normal recursion. So you could have both zero and one being a base case. Uh, and sometimes you might hit one, sometimes you might hit the other one, or hopefully at least you hit one of them and, and as you're going down. Because if, if, if you have a scenario where you don't ever hit a base case, again, we get into infinite recursion, which screws things up. So that's the base case. That is usually represented in the recurrence relation as T of zero. The other scenario is the recursive case, which we represent as T of n, in which case it means time to solve a problem of size n. Now, let me take a moment here to explain what I mean by size n, okay? This again, recurrence relations can be used for both space and time computations. So the word size typically tends to kind of lead you into the size stuff, into like a space stuff, but it's more talking about how, how uh, in the terms of space, yes, how big some a, a problem is, but in the terms of time, how many comparisons or how many operations, the size of the, the number of comparisons. So that's why they, the word size here can be a little bit misleading, but this can be applied for both space and time. In space, yes, it's the size of the input. In terms of time, it's the number of comparisons or the number of operations. So it would be these guys, okay? So like, like the number of operations in the loop, for example, this one. So don't, don't be misled by the word size in there, okay? So yes, and now again, is this is going to be your recursive case, okay? So uh, yeah, questions about that so far? Okay, I shall, I shall assume that everybody is following along and everything is easy and we're all getting A's, right? Okay, cool. 
So, how do we solve such such a, such a problem here? How do we solve that? Well, we we can kind of try to analyze and see what would be the the the, the recursion here and how how things are solved. So, if, so if if we if you look at the problem, you know, let's let's throw in some numbers and see what happens. Okay. So let's say that we are throwing in a five and a two. Okay. So x is equal to five, and n is equal to two. Okay. In the scenario here, what the, what this is supposed to do is basically take five to the power of two. Okay. That's that's what this function is doing. And you can easily see that by seeing that in this case, n is equal to two. So we we go into this case right here. And so five times the result of this recursion. And in this recursion, everything is the same with the exception of the n being subtracted with one. So from two, it becomes one. So then it runs one more time, in which case x is still equal to five, but n is equal to one. And then it runs again. And, th and again, the solution is the result of a third recursive call where x is equal to five and n is equal to zero. Uh, let me just so I can put, keep them in order. Let me just flip them all up like that. Okay. Wow. Wow. Fail. One zero. Okay. So now finally in the third recursive call, we hit the base case and that returns a one. So this returns a one out of that. Okay. And so now we go back in here to the one where we're right here. In this one, we're going to have a one times a five here. So this will return a five. And then we finally get back to the to the top level of the recursion where we have a five from this now and that's going to be returning a five times five which is going to be 25 so that's how we're going to get our answer so that's how this recursion is working itself okay and so if we want to analyze how long this is going to take we can see that every time that there's a recursive call we're getting one step closer to our answer right when we started with two the next step was one, and finally we got to the base case, which was zero. So would you agree with me that if I was to feed it something of the shape of x is equal to five and n is equal to, uh, to, to five as well, would you agree with me that it would go from five, then to four, then to three, then to two, then to one, then to zero? I hope that you do, because it seems to be going in, in steps of one. And so it turns out that the representation of this as a recurrence relation is going to be that the time it takes to run the full program is based on going on, on a step of one by one. So n minus one. Okay. So if I want to represent and say, how long does this program take to run? It takes to run, however, the same program time minus one step takes to run. Okay. Because that's how far we can get in a single step in the program. And there's also a constant added here. And this constant is however that current step takes, okay? Which is always gonna be the same amount for each step. It's always the same time it takes, right? Because they all run the same code with the exception of maybe the base case because it runs a different piece of code. But that's kind of irrelevant because it's just a base case, okay? Uh, you, can, you, can, you can even write that down if you care as saying t of zero is just equal to some constant zero and we'll say this is a constant one okay so let me go ahead and throw this down here with our space so we have t of zero is equal to some constant one and then t of n is equal to however long t of n minus one takes to run i gotta write slower so i can write neater plus another constant which we'll call we'll just call this one c because we'll write it a lot okay this one's the only one that has a special thing attached to it are we doing uh, certificates for both loops and recursive functions um that's the thing you can you can you, you can do certificates for recursive um but first we got to solve the recurrence relation but here's the thing about it Recurrence relations are a mathematical way of solving a symptotic complexity. The fact that you're solving a recurrence relation is kind of like a proof by induction. So the fact that you solved it is, 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 is proof enough that that is the correct answer. Certificates are given because it's more of like you took a guess when you solved it. Because, I mean, that's really what we're doing up here is we were guessing. You know, we, we, we looked at this and we kind of guessed some numbers, right? And the... The purpose of the certificate is to prove that your guess is correct. However, 
with a recurrence relation, if you do it right, there's no guessing. It's a mathematical solution to a problem. Therefore, the act of you solving it is proof that it's correct, which means that you don't need to prove with a certificate that it is. You can, if you want, for extra safety, because I mean, you might have done the wrong recurrence relation in the first place, I suppose. But uh, the fact that you stopped proving it mathematically means that you don't really need a certificate for it, okay? So uh, I'll leave it at that. So anyways, how do we solve this? How do we solve this recurrence relation right here, okay? Uh, just just to, uh, to make our life easier, um, and, and to not freak you out with with, uh, with 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 numbers, I'm gonna go ahead and replace C with a number, just just with a number, and then we'll do it with the general case of C, okay? Because people freak out when they see multiple variables. So we're gonna say T of zero takes uh, two, and then we are gonna say that T of n is equal to T of n minus one. plus two, okay? So we'll say that every every step takes two. What I'm saying here is that the amount of time it takes to run the base case happens to be the same time it takes to run one step of the solution when you're doing the multiplication. Now we know that's technically not true because uh, it's so much faster to return a variable, just re in fact, to return a constant than it is to actually do a multiplication. But again, we'll come back to the case where we split that, okay? So how do we solve this? Does anybody have any idea of how to figure this out? Like, what do you think that we should do? There's multiple ways of solving a recurrence relation, by the way. In fact, guess what? Spoiler alert. There's a very easy way to do a lot of recurrence relations that we'll talk about, hopefully, if we have time. If not, they'll talk about in 477. That will kind of solve, that will kind of just give you a quick answer to some of them. It's called the master theorem. And if we get to it, we will. If not, then you'll learn about it in 477. But uh, we're first going to kind of go with the hard way. So you can rewrite to, you can rewrite t of n minus one again. So yeah, so you are in the right thing. So here's the thing: if I want to solve this, if I want to solve what t of n is equal to, I need to figure out what t of n minus one is equal to two. So I can go ahead and put in here: if I can know what the answer to this is, I can solve that. So let's let's just say that magically I knew that t of n minus one was equal to eight. Okay? If I knew that was the answer, then I could know that t of n was equal to ten. Like, I would know that because I can just plug it in. Unfortunately, I do not know. Uh, wait, I missed it. Why is t of 0 equal to 2? I just went ahead and replaced the, const, uh, the c with a, with a number just to make the example easier. Uh, I, but if you want to keep it with a c, you can keep it with a c. Um, it just, it's just so you can see something, okay? So, this would give us a solution. You know, if we could solve this in terms of what t of n is, is, is equal to, we could... We could solve this essentially, and and and, may, and and you know, and our lives would be good. However, what can what is that represented as? What is t of n minus one equal to two? Well, it turns out that you can plug it into this equation by replacing anywhere you see n. So anywhere that you see an n, you can replace it with an n minus one to figure out what the solution to t of n minus one is. So it turns out that you could say that t of n minus one is the same thing as t of n minus 2 plus, and then you have the 2 that you have from here, and then you have another 2 that is going to come as well from, from the other one, okay? So you could have something like that. So you're closer, but you're not quite there yet because you have no idea how long you can do this. Because like you could see how like the next step here could be like, well, I could say n minus 3, or sorry, n minus 2 is equal to t of n minus 3 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, right? And then just keep going like that. But the question is, when do you stop? Well, you stop when the number here is equal to n, right? Would you agree with me that t of n minus n is going to be basically equal to t of 0 plus how many of these do we need? Well, it turns out that every time that you're growing one, you know, from 0, 1, 2, you're multiplying it times a number, right? So you're going to have n of these. So you're going to end up with 2n, okay? And so if you do that, then you know what this is equal to because you know this is a 2, right? So then you can say that t of n minus n 
is going to which which of course is the same thing as just zero um, is equal to two plus two n okay so somebody says something t of n is equal to t n minus one plus n plus 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 n minus zero yes so you are indeed correct so you can basically say that t of n is equal to the addition of all of the terms from from basically going from n to n minus one n minus two n minus three n minus four all the way to zero so you have to add them all together all the terms and each of the terms is giving you a two right you're adding a two to each of them so you have two n of them okay and so that basically is going to be plus i think you have an extra two which is the base case um do you um yes you do i think you have a, you have a, yeah from the base case you have that but however if you want to plug in back into our, our constant values if you if you don't like the twos this becomes uh c of n plus the c1 right which was this one here right however you know this this is a lot easier to see as to how we got this out of that than if we kept it with constants okay so the solution to this recurrent relation is actually c of n plus c and that belongs to the o of n class right again you don't need to but you could put in your certificate which in this case your certificate would just be that c but again it's just a c so that is kind of already what you would have put there now if you if you have specific numbers like this with the two of n plus two then your certificate would be potentially something like c is equal to uh to three right just just to cover yourself for the extra two here and then n is greater than one right but again because we were dealing with it with constants in the first place you don't even need to do a certificate does that make sense as to how we got the two of n which again is just o of n it's a big jump that we did there this is actually a proof by induction because an induction what you do is you uh you make a you, you make a, a a proposal a proposal for an answer and then you prove it on the step before it so you know if it makes you feel better instead of using an n here you could use a k because i think that's what they love using an induction as a k and that k is going to basically be equal to n okay i think i have a somewhere in the notes here somebody that did a, did a proof by induction um Yeah, so this one here, we, we can do this one. This one's more, more, more pure induction. So let's do another case. In the, this, this, in this recurrence relation that we're about to do, we have t of n is equal to two times t of n minus one plus one, and then the base case is t of zero is equal to zero. Okay, so that's the base case on that one. Um, what kind of what kind of uh, code would, would give us some sort of recurrence relation like this? Um, that's a tricky one. Well, the the plus one here is just like kind of like a pow, but the times two here means that you would have to have a branch, right? So you'd have to have a, rec a recursion that has two recursive calls in it. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be something like uh, uh, int p, and then we are going to have an, I think we, here, let's just do in through variables in here. Okay, and then we are basically saying um, if here we can use an n for one of these. If n is equal equal to zero, return return one. Or here, just return. Let's make this easier. Make it a void function. Okay. Otherwise. Uh, we have two recursive calls so we're gonna have p n minus one and uh, this don't we don't need to do but i guess so that there's a purpose to this function we'll say that y gets uh two added to it for some reason okay and then we also have and then th this this gets uh yeah sure okay p we get also n minus one 
y minus 2. I have no idea what this will do, by the way. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so here we have a piece of code that has two recursive calls. This is really doing absolutely nothing. We should add some sort of cout statement. So here, we can just see out y. There we go. So now it has a purpose. OK? So now we have some code. And this kind of code would actually deliver us the recurrence relation that I'm seeing up there. OK? I think it would. Normally, you do it the other way around. Normally, you have code, and then you get the recurrence relation out of that. I'm trying to like reverse engineer this. Um, but I think that would actually give you that. Because the, the fact that you see a 2 there, the 2TN two, two minus 1 means that there has to be two recursive calls per, state, per step. So uh, as you can see, the fact that we have two recursive calls is going to grow because if one of those recursive calls has another recursive call of itself, then, th then it's going to be four recursive calls, and then eight, and then 16. So that is a sign that this is going to be exponential, OK? Because it's just going to grow forever. Um, would it be plus two? TLC happens twice. I I have no guarantees that this would actually ever finish, but uh, actually it will finish because they're both going to minus one. So as long as you pass a positive number, it, it's okay. It's oh, I see what you're asking. That's okay. In fact, you should each each of these should should definitely not hopefully it has to hit a base case. So they both have to get to a base case at some point. Uh, no, I meant T of n plus 2. Um, no, because that's just a constant. You, you, you might be confusing yourself. This plus 1 or plus 2 is a time measurement of the number of, of the time it takes to do an operation. What I'm saying is that as a whole, every step of the way is just a plus 1 to our time, which is really going to give us a number of, number of recursive calls that we have. That's what this code is going to give us, really. So... That's a constant. Again, if, if it makes you feel better, we could just totally make that into a C. But uh, that plus one is, is sort of irrelevant to us. It's just kind of a number that we need to put there to see how many operations it takes. If it was a two in there, it would be even, even stranger because like, what is the two in relation to what? To, is there a one to compare, right? This is merely saying, we're not computing how long an actual, how long it takes to run the code in here. We're just saying it takes a constant amount of time, which we're going to say is one. Okay. But anyways, I think that that's, that would be kind of what this code would do, but let's go back to the actual recurrence relation. Okay. So we bring that down here. And so this one, we're going to solve by induction. Okay. So in induction, um, there's three steps to induction, right? So the first one is you have to show that the basis is true. Then you have to make an assumption for a step. And then you have to, using that assumption, show that it, that it uh, applies to the other cases. Okay, that's kind of like induction in, in, in a very short, brief version. There's more to it, but you learn induction in 251 probably or whatever, or you learn it in calculus. Um, so what is the basis that we're trying to show? The basis that we're trying to show is that t, t of 0, which can be either written like this or written like this, as I have it. Uh, we want to say that that is equal to 2 to some power, which in this case is going to be 0, minus 1 is going to be equal to 0. Now, there's a big jump here. How the heck did I come up with that? That's the thing with induction. You start by making an assumption. So we're going to make that assumption. Now, why am I making that assumption? Because remember what I said here, that this is going to go exponential? Because the first, if you have a, if you have a, if n is equal to 1, then you just have two recursive cases, right? But if n is equal to 2, how many recursive cases are you going to have? If you draw a little recursive 3, if you took 202 with me, we did this, um, you start out with 2, but then the next time around, the next layer, you're going to have 4 like that. And then the next one, you're going to have 8 like that, right? And so this is going to grow exponentially, right? It's going to go to a power. It's going to be squared, 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 but it's squared based on the n, right? So n is, is going to really represent what the power is. It's always going to be 2. So really, it's going in powers of in, in powers of 2, but the n here is actually the exponent, okay? It's not the other way around. It's not like some constant to a power of, so, so some n to some constant power. No, it's like 2 to the power of however times you're running this here. Okay, 
And because of that, I am, I am, I am making that assumption that that is going to be the answer. Okay. I'm making the assumption that the answer is going to be some sort of exponent. Okay. So I'm saying that I have to, to start off, I have to show that the base case is true. Would it be true if I said two to the zero minus one is equal to zero? The answer is yes, because any number to an exponent of zero is going to be any real number, I suppose, to a zero exponent is going to be equal to one. And so one minus one is equal to zero. Okay. The second part of induction is we're going to assume that it's true for t of n minus one. Okay. So we're going to assume that it's that it's true to t of n minus one. Okay. Uh, and if, if we assume that this is the case that is true for that, then we can we can use that assumption to show that t of n is going to be equal to two times t of n minus one plus one, right? Because if you look up here, that's exactly what we have up there. Two t of n minus one, right? Uh, oh, sorry, I wrote the parentheses in the wrong spot. Plus or minus one, plus one, right? So we're gonna show in this assumption that if we plug those numbers in here, then this is gonna work out. So we're gonna say that that is equal to writing two and then plug in what it would be for two of zero minus one. So in this case, it would be two of n minus one because that's where we're putting the n number and then keep the minus one there and then just go ahead and add the one outside, okay? So we're saying, we're making that assumption because we're, we're assuming that you can just, whatever two to this power is, we're going to assume that it's following the same rule that we made up here. And in that case, we are basically plugging in for, for T of n minus one, we're plugging that in. We're saying that T of n minus one is equal essentially to two of n minus one plus one. Okay, we're making that assumption. So then if we simplify this, you know, it, it basically turns out to, to be two of n, uh, two of n is, it, is it just two of n, I think, because the minus one gets rescued by this, because here, I, I, should not, I should not skip steps in case you're rusty. You can say that this is two of one times two of n minus one plus negative two, technically, okay? Plus one, okay? So that's kind of, because you, you factor this here and then you factor it there. Okay, well, this is basically the same thing as saying n minus 1 plus 1 because of this. So that just becomes 2 to the n. And then the this part here is basically saying 1 minus 2, which is equal to just negative 1, right? So this becomes 2 of n minus 1, okay? And there you go, proof by induction. Because that case worked, it means that it must work for all other cases. And so this is of the order of exponential. That's a really, really slow algorithm. Like, you would not want to be waiting for that algorithm to finish. Okay? Um, I, I guess I never show you those, those layers. But, like, again, once you get to, like, the n squared, n cubed, and so on, uh, the biggest thing you can see there is, is, is a constant, like, 2 to the n, 3 to the n, 4 to the n and so on and, and and of course you can get n to the n like that which is even slower and then the slowest of them all which is factorial okay but uh yeah so that means this algorithm is trash if you give a big enough number for this you are going to sec fall essentially <laughs> okay because you can see how, how how quickly it grows like there's just going to be an insane amount of operations there let's just let's just you know plug it in let's say you want to run n equals 10 Two to the two to the ten, I believe, is ten twenty-four. So it's going to run one thousand twenty-three recursive calls. Each recursive call takes one second. It's going to take about a thousand seconds to run. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is the number of recursive calls. That's what's going to get you to sec fault. So how does that does that make sense? With the, the little quick proof by induction kind of thing. I'm not going to make you prove by induction of the test, but um, you know, I think those that were asked before. It's a good thing to know. Okay, let me, let me go back to the other example now and show you a different way of solving it, okay? I do have a really cool long example that I want to do, but uh, that one I will not do until next class because I don't want to cut it halfway short. So what we're going to do for the rest of the time is I want to show you one other way of solving the previous one, 
Then I want to do a quick, quick review about logarithms before we do the example next class. And then um, we'll call it a day because we only got 15 minutes left. So don't worry. We are just kind of jumping into this. If you still kind of kind of iffy about it, I'll do my best to uh, get you through it. But like I said, this is probably the hardest topic of the course. So let's go back to the example that we had before. Uh, we had something of the form of t of n is equal to t of n minus 1 plus 2, right? And now we're going to have a base case of that, just, just for the sake of difference. But it's basically the same thing we did before, okay? So uh, I want to... I want to show you, so right now you have seen how to solve from the beginning to the end, right? So you got to see that we start with the end, then we do n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, and so on. You can also solve it from the bottom up, per se. So you can solve it from the zero all the way to the end. And by the way, why am I showing you all these different methods and not just showing you one method? It turns out that recurrence relations are a little bit like differential equations in that there's no one method that you can use. If you know anything about differential equations and like Laplace transforms and all that, you will know that depending on what the equation that you're trying to solve is, you have to apply a different method. And some of them, there's not even a method to solve it and you're kind of just screwed. You have to solve it like experimentally or something. It's the same thing with recurrence relations. There is, even with the master theorem, which, which does solve a, a big subset of them, but it's still just a subset of the entire possible uh, recurrence relations you could get. Turns out that some of them are just like, actually, there might be some that are like, is there any that are unsolvable? I'm not sure. That, that gets into the decidability. But there's definitely some that there's no easy way to solve them, and you just have to like, like do some crazy math to do it, like super crazy math. So uh, that is why I'm just showing you a couple of different ways. And typically, these will work for very, very basic stuff. But, you know, it's okay. Again, like I said, in 477 and then your math classes, they'll go a little bit further on the recurrence relations that we're going to do here. So anyway, let's try to solve this from the bottom up instead, okay? So first of all, let us go ahead and, uh, and, and flip this, this equation around. So let us flip this equation and say that t of n minus t of n minus 1 is equal to 2, okay? Because that's just an easy easy flip flip the location of a, of a variable essentially to the other side, okay? Now, let us go ahead and do this since with t of 1 and solve for a term like that. So, because we know that t of 1 is equal to 2, right? But also, if we plug in t of 1 in terms of our equation that we have here, then that says that t of 1 is equal to... Uh, uh, that t of 1 minus 1 should be equal to 2, right? According to that equation, technically speaking, right? And we know what t of 1 is equal to because it's just equal to 2. So we can say that 2 of 0 is equal to 2, right? Because 1 minus 1 is 0. And if we do that, then we can go ahead and flip that around to the other side and we can say t of 0 is equal to 2 minus 2, right? So what I did is I bring that to this side and I bring the 2 to that side. And if I do that, then I can say that t of 0 is equal to 0. Okay, that's cool. That's nice. Now, could I do that also with the next term? Could I do that with t of 2 if I wanted to solve that? Uh, I sure could. So I could say t of 2 must be equal to t of 2 minus 1, which must be equal to 2, right? It has to be equal to 2 uh, because that's what the original equation told us here, this one. And now I, I can go ahead and, uh, and, 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 and simplify this and say t of 2 is equal to t of 1 because 2 minus 1 is 1 is equal to 2, right? And I know what t of 1 is because that's actually my base case and that is equal to 2. So I can just plug it in. So I can say t of 2 minus 2 is equal to 2, right? And if I add 2 to both sides, I cancel that, then I can say that t of 2 is equal to 4, okay? I could keep doing this. In fact, let's do it one more time. Let's say that we want to figure out what t of 3 is equal to. Well, t of 3 is equal to uh, essentially what the equation up here says. So that is uh, t of 3 minus t of 3 minus 1 is equal to 2, right? And this is the same thing as writing t of 2, which we know is equal to 4. So really, this is t of 3 
minus 4 is equal to 2. We add 4 to both sides. We can see that t of 3 is equal to 6. Okay? So you can see how I can kind of work my way. Of course, now I have to do this like n times to figure out what n would be, right? But let us kind of follow the pattern and put this in a sort of nicer way. So uh, for that, I'm going to copy paste. I don't feel like writing this a lot. And I have it written here already. Yay, it worked. Okay, so I'm, I went ahead and wrote all of the terms that I had so far. So I have the t of one minus t of zero. I lost, I lost this part of it, but I have it. And then I wrote it for t of two, t of three, t of four, t of five, t of six, t of 9,000. Then finally we get to the ends. We get t of n minus two, t of n minus three, t of n minus one, and finally, the last term, which would have been t of n minus t of n minus 1 is equal to 2, right? Those are all the terms that I have right there. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more in there. In fact, there's n of them. Now, if I solve them all, all I got to do is potentially add them together, right? That's all I got to do. I got to add them together. Notice something about this. I'm going to copy and paste it twice so I can do that I want you to notice something about this because because right now what I have to do is I have to add them together right that is my mission to add them together if I was just adding these two terms right here let's say that I only needed let's say that n was equal to 3 or something and I just needed to add these three terms right here if that's what I had to do I will basically write this as um, t of how to write this without well here let's just copy paste this yet one more time beneath so if I was to add this together I would just add the left side and the right side right so the, le the right side is easy I would just do 2 plus 2 plus 2 which is 6 and the left side I will do t of 1 minus t of 0 plus t of 2 minus t of 1 plus t of 3 minus t of 2, right? Uh, notice here that I am adding this term, but then I'm subtracting it. So those cancel each other out. And then these two cancel each other out, right? So I really end up with just t of 3 minus t of 0 equal to 6. I know what t of 0 is because that's my base case. Well, it wasn't my base case, but I solved that. Right, I solve that up here, and it's equal to zero. And because it's equal to zero, this just becomes t of three minus zero is equal to six. So just t of three is equal to six. And there you go. We have now essentially uh, solved what uh, what this is. Now you're like, wait a second, six is just a number. That's kind of useless because we wanted to solve it for n. Okay. Then let's go back to the general problem. In the general problem, we have the same thing, but we need to solve it for n, right? In this case, n was 3, by the way. So I suppose that you can start to see a pattern there that it's twice the number, right? But here's the thing. In here, that same cancellation can be done for all of these. Because this cancels with this, 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 this would cancel with that down there, this 9001 would cancel with that. This would cancel to this, this would cancel with this, and you would see that they will all literally cancel except for the first and last term, just like it was the case with this one here. So really, this whole recurrence relation can be written in terms of t of n minus t of zero equal to, and then how many of these are going to have? Well, because we're going in steps of one, it's just going to be two to the n steps again. And then that t of zero we know is equal to zero, and because it's equal to zero, then it just becomes and saying t of n is equal to 2 of n, which does go with what we said beneath because it was 3 and 6 here. And that is then equal to O of n, right? And I suppose if you really wanted to, you could do your certificate and say c is equal to 2 and greater than 1, and there is your certificate, right? And that is the same thing that we got when we did it in the other method up here.
right somewhere in here. Here. Right there. Okay? So we have the same solution. We did it in different ways. One of them, we, we approach it from the bottom down, and then we did it from the bottom up. So you can choose your you can choose which side you want to attack to a problem as long as you attack it successfully, right? And these are two different ways to attack it. So uh Yes. Any questions on that? I'm trying to uh, see what I can sh show you. Yeah, I'll stop it. I think right there. That one. Yeah. You're all very quiet, which is not usually a good sign. It means you guys are all confused and lost, but I mean, can't read your mind, but I kind of am. But uh, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll do more examples of this and you'll get familiarized with it. You understand it? You see the light at the end of the tunnel? That's good. Okay. Um, like I said, this recurrent relation stuff is a little bit of an art where you're just trying different things and uh, seeing what sticks basically in the wall. So, yeah. The second method made more sense. That's good. That's good. Always, yeah, you know, it, in, in some problems, you have, the, you have the choice to which method you want to use because they, they, they all work. And then, of course, you want to pick the one that you're more familiar with. I'm going to show you another another different way kind of, of doing it, which is going to be similar to this. And then we'll also do an example of this again next time. But that one's a little bit longer. But uh, for the last uh, three minutes of class, and then whatever I don't do for here, I'll, I'll finish the next class. Is I want to do a quick review of logarithms because... As you can see, one of the time complexities that we deal a lot with is logarithms. And a lot of people are rusty with logarithms. So it might be a good idea to kind of quickly go over it. Because, I mean, I don't see other people asking questions. Uh, so is this how we solve the recursive version of the four codes in assignment two? Yes, it is. Um, yeah. Yeah, indeed it is. So now you should have enough to solve it. There are other methods, but those problems are... are I, I like using the word easy, so I guess I'll use it, whatever. These problems are so easy that you should be able to solve them with this, okay? They're not quote, quote, easy, easy, but they are on the easier side. So these two methods should help you out with that. They should be the rather simple ones. So, uh, yes. It'll be good practice to solve them that way. Um, and if you guys are truly lost with that, I can always extend that assignment so that you can have the Monday and make it do like Monday night so you have the Monday class for questions if, uh, if it helps. Um, I have the power to do that in 302. Not in 202, but in 302 I can. I can do whatever I want. Power. So, yes. <laughs> um, anyways. I guess we don't really have the time for the logarithm stuff. So I, well, I kind of want to use it, but oh well. Uh, we shall start with the logarithms next time. Just, here's one, one hint about the logarithm stuff. It's a base, always think of base two when you're doing computer science stuff. And that's something that I was going to talk about. But I don't have time, so yeah. Is the next lecture going to be all recurrent relations again? Yes, it is. We will we'll do as many lectures as we need to get through this topic in everybody's uh, head because it is probably the hardest topic. And so that is it. Oh, somebody just sub. Yeah. There's like ethical questions about people subbing. <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, I mean, you guys are already paying like thousands of dollars so why are you losing more money you're getting scammed at that point but anyways uh we will like i said if you guys are really lost in the assignment when you're doing the recurrent stuff we can extend it further just let me know on discord or canvas and then we will have more time extending it to monday is a good idea okay so for now at least we'll make it do monday night that way if you guys are all panicking and everything's on fire, you can tell me on Monday and then we can extend it further. Okay? The extra credit is out there though. I recommend if you have time, if you if you if this is easy peasy for you and you finished it already, then uh, you can do the extra credit for points. I did post an extra credit on Inspector Gadget. And then I also uh, the final project is posted. So you can if you have time and you're bored, <laughs> then just go code that. And then uh, you'll thank yourself later near the end of the semester. So there is stuff to do, even as the assignment gets extended. So, yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and set it for Monday night then. How does the timestamp extra credit work? Uh, somebody told me they're doing that. I can't remember if it was this class or the next class. So, or sorry, not this or next. If it's a 202 or 302, 
So if, the, if for Trio 2 they're doing it already, it means that the previous videos will have a timestamp. I don't know if that was this, if, which class that was for, but I know somebody's doing it. And if somebody's doing it, I don't want two people to do it because it's pointless. Um, let me check by lo loading up one of the videos from the class. I just can't remember which class they did it for. I think they are, it was it was this class, but it might have been 202. Yeah, they're doing it for 302 already. So yeah, so somebody's already doing the timestamp extra credit. So that is no longer available. You can still do the extra credit where you can do your own notes and then uh, submit them at the end of the semester. <laughs> oh, yeah. So <laughs> that was funny with the caps. So um, I forgot the math. But I think you get 300 homework points or 400, I can't remember. But the reason I made it so high is because uh, you, you will get that in like the course of like three weeks of watching. And so the way I had it before, you'd get the points in about a week of worth of watching. So I was in the summer, I was getting like so many extra credit requests that it was just like, it was, it was, it was, it was tiresome to, to put them all in. So now I increase the number of extra credit points so that you, um, you, you have less submissions to do of them. And then near the end of the semester, so you don't get stuck with like 8,000 points, I will make smaller tiers so that you can maximize your redemption of the points, okay? But for now, it's better to just accumulate them and redeem them later on instead of having to redeem them like 50,000 times. And then I have to like keep doing that at the end. I, I, I will spend like 10 minutes after each lecture just like redeeming the points on Twitch. So uh, uh, claiming the points that you guys redeem on Twitch. So. So now we'll do it that way. There will be smaller tiers so you can maximize your points accumulated. But for now, we'll leave the big one, that, that one big one. But I think that's 300 or 400, 400 points. I can't remember. Um, I think it's 300, but it, it might have been four. I got to check how much I had before in the past. I think it was 3,000 points. No, can't, I'll figure it out. But it's, we'll figure that out. Right now, you just accumulate them and you're fine. So no problem. Um, 3,400 points. Yeah, so I think that was the equivalent of 100 regular homework points. So then if now it's 10,000, then yeah, that, so that would be 300 points then of homework points. So that's about a homework, one, one assignment's worth. You should be able to accumulate about 20,000 points over the semester, I think, if I, if, I, if I recall correctly, approximately how much you will accumulate. If you were to like literally watch every, every single lecture and like, I think you have to type stuff too. It gives you more points. I'm not sure. It's just magic. But, uh, all right then. Well, we only had class one day. It, it does kind of feel like things are moving slow because of it, because we only had one class this week. And we also have the same thing happen in uh, Memorial Day. But uh, things will pick up, as I said. This class is hard. I think you guys are like, probably like, oh, this is easy, relaxing. But you just wait. <laughs> you just wait. So enjoy it. Enjoy the, the, the cool, chill times that we are at lip that we're living in not really but that at least in the class we're living okay so uh until then i thank you for watching and i hope that you guys took something out of this and i uh i wish you all to uh to to have a safe and healthy weekend and uh stay safe and i will see you guys on discord or canvas at a later time i'll be available take care thanks for watching and have a great day guys bye stay safe <laughs>